what's really, I think, interesting is that all of that early days, I would say that you did pretty much all of it, you know, as a group sort of self-funding it. You kind of made your own money, invested your own money, and the business would roll the money round. It's much tougher nowadays, although not impossible by any means. But when you've gone through the other side of all this, which is you've raised money through private equity and you've made, made, raised money with initial public offerings, you know, you're a publicly traded company on the UK Stock Exchange. Um, it's, it's very impressive to see that happen. And you could say you're a mile away from, or a million miles away from where it all was. I, I would say probably not. I'd say the same principles are playing, you know, knowing the business, understanding how it ticks, understanding the product, understanding the customer. What, what sort of tips would you give, though, to companies looking to raise finance? I mean, Spike does it for a living, you know, in, in kind of in the, in the VC world. But what, what, what tips would you give groups, companies, individuals to, to raise the money that they need, yeah. they think they need in order to, 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 get, to get the growth that they, that they want? Yeah, it really depends on what stage they are. You know, I'm not an expert on seed funding, as we've shared. You know, we did, we were on our journey. I did our management buyout, you know, in 2011. And then I did private equity fundraising. I'm trying to remember my years now, 2016. Yeah. You know, and that was the first part. I think having done a management buyout, which was quite painful in terms of paperwork and coming to terms with that side of it, we kind of had our house in order. I brought in a really good CFO, you know, um, who was very focused on getting the systems and getting the processes in place. Mm -hmm. So when we went to do private equity, we already were a fairly efficient business in terms of paperwork, you know, and I still say to people, you know, making keeping decent archives even if you're a simple even if you're a small business archiving everything properly doing your basic housekeeping that you should do you know this will save you a huge amount of time you know further down the line um you know private equity for me was quite interesting because you know we we'd already started the transformation of the business you know and it's quite frightening for me when i look back and i go actually eight years ago 99 percent of our revenue came from one ip and we were turning over less than five million and when you look at where it's at today it's it's insane growth right um but we'd already started that journey but what we did have was in 2016 i already had four years back-to-back -back revenue growth back-to-back -back profit growth so it looked good it looked we were going in the right direction the accounts and books were incredibly clean. These are important things. We weren't selling hockey stick growth to those people. You know, um, I spend a lot of time looking at M&A and a, a lot of that, you see a lot of hockey stick growth. And when you look at the history of the companies, most of them have never even been close to the kind of growth that they're telling you they're going to do next year. Right. So being incredibly realistic about what you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, we only spoke to a very small handful of private equity companies, every single one of them tabled offers for what we were asking, you know, um, but I just think Team 17 was a rock solid business. I mean, really solid, yeah. un good foundations. Um, we'd done the hard part. We'd already transformed it. We'd proven the business model concepts. You know, we had our case studies um, and private equity. It's a painful process, you know. And you, Ironically, I did an IPO in 91 days and private equity took my CFO at that time six months. You know, it's amazing when you think how fast we did an IPO compared to that. But when we had a lot of our information in a, in a good state, um, but also what I always say to people, just remember they're buying the team, you know, they're investing in the team. It's not just the product. And I think a lot of people forget that, yeah. you know, it's just as important, you know, um, to make sure that you've got your team in place. And I, I say to people, even today, you know, if you are a startup and you can't pay, you want good quality people working with you, slice up that cake of equity, please, because it's the only way that you're going to get the quality that you need to grow the business in the right way. And that cake's only going to get bigger and you'll get the money anyway, as long as you've got the right people in place. You know, yeah, that's, very, that's think, very sensible um, advice. I mean, what, what strikes me, again and again, Debbie, is that you, you, you know, you, you've got a robust business. You've always had a robust business. You don't overextend yourself as a company, but you're ambitious. So it's a balance of 
not going too fast, but never going in second gear anywhere. You, you want to get into top gear, but you want to get that progression, if you, if you know what I mean. And I think that's really important because, you know, it's hard to raise money when you're on the back foot. In other words, when a company is not doing great but has don't got do it. Their- don't. it's the worst time it's the worst possible time to do it yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd agree and i think that you know the best time to raise money is when you've got when you've got a story but you've also got traction you've got something and i think that's difficult for companies to get to that point where they start to get the traction that they want it's not impossible i mean i i, I work with a bunch of different smaller developers, all of whom have got sustainable businesses. And actually they're very happy. You know, they, they're usually small teams. They're usually, there's a couple of sets of brothers and, you know, which is a factor in our industry going back. And they all understand their product, obviously, and they understand the community. And actually their biggest, I suppose their biggest threat in their minds is what do we do when we're like, you know, they're so integral to the business that getting time out or time off is very, very difficult for them. I mean, how, how do you deal with that stuff? I mean, you're not, you don't, I don't ever see you zip, zipping off on holiday anywhere. So, Look, not, not I'm a very ha- months anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Andy's known me a long time. I'm not that person. Uh, look, I, my attitude is really simple you know my passion is my job so every day doesn't feel like a job right um I usually have to get told when to take breaks and that comes from you know these days my board or other people because they're trying to make sure I look after myself and I don't burn myself out because I'd happily work as until somebody forces me to stop I love what I do um I think the important thing is you know bring the right people around you you heard me talk there when i was doing my management buyout i brought in you know somebody very experienced from outside of the games industry in particular for budget controls and finance and cfo advice absolutely best thing i ever did you know needed that you know and i think you have to when we did our private equity we didn't need money either we'd already we had plenty of money um it was a for me it was a test before I went to IPO could I cope in a in the private equity world and could I cope with board meetings to be totally honest you know I'm I like to get jobs done I don't like to sit in rooms talking whatever about yeah. whatever may be the future well probably won't happen half the time right um so I needed to know how I'd deal with that and how I'd cope with people like LDC who were amazing for me. So that was all good. And I think it set us up well when we did our IPO. Again, we didn't need to raise funds. We already had money. We left one of the few companies to actually do an IPO, which didn't allow any cash strip in the business. So all the cash stayed in the business. You know, um, I was adamant. And, you know, at the time, I, you know, I think I'm still the biggest shareholder in the company today as an individual, but I was the biggest shareholder then. You know, you have to not think about the money. You have to think about where you want to go. And I that's the lesson for a lot of people. Don't get greedy. Don't get greedy. Look at where you're trying to get to. You know, I always say to people, I was the lowest paid employee in Team 17 for about six years while we were building and transforming a company. And rightly so as well. 